Michael. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Zoom session number 127. And ask the pastor the question for this third session of our series is Pastor, what is the church's theology of leadership? <clears throat> now, hopefully, the church's theology of leadership, which is to say the pastor's philosophy of leadership, is not the approach the Savior condemned in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 30, which I dealt with two sessions ago. Let me read that passage again. But Jesus called them unto him and said, you know, the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever shall be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I will not this evening insult you by dealing with the so-called ministries of people like Joel Osteen and Greg Laurie and Rick Warren or any of the women preachers, all of whom are little more than religious hucksters. My focus uh, on this series of Ask the Pastor questions is on gospel ministers. In our last Ask the Pastor session, I discussed a real shepherding style of ministry. And at that time, I noted that although it was a real shepherding style of ministry, I noted that it was just not the biblical shepherding style of ministry. And that is the Western Mediterranean style of shepherding that was most common in such countries as Spain, Portugal, among the Basques of the Pyrenees Mountains, in France, in the Low Countries, in England, um, in uh, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. And if you will recall, the shepherds of that type and in those regions I just named invariably use sheepdogs, which although it is shepherding, it is not the approach to shepherding that is advocated by the Savior and by the apostles. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if you are watching this and you watched the previous episode or session did I offend you last time by suggesting that many ministries reflect this style of shepherding? Only they replace sheepdogs that yip and nip the flock with young associate pastors that do their version of yipping and nipping at the, at the flock. Now, I meant no offense by that, but I was nevertheless interested in an accurate depiction of far too many ministries that I have observed. Before we proceed, as with each of these Ask the Pastor episodes, your input and opinions are valued. Please send any questions you might have for future consideration, along with your comments and any corrections. Be sure to use, include citations where you think I'm wrong. Show me why you think I'm wrong and send those to pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church, and I would very much appreciate that. So at this point, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We pray for the pastor's wife in Riverside. We pray for Brittany, the young mother of six children with, um, <clears throat> who's facing um, heart transplant. We pray your blessings upon her. Uh, that you might minister to her, continue to greatly comfort her, give her great grace and wisdom. Please strengthen and encourage her husband and her children and her family and the congregation. And we will for that. Uh, thank you. And thank you also for blessing during this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This uh, third session, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with 
uh, shepherding style, is, I will be dealing with Eastern Mediterranean style shepherding as opposed to the Western Mediterranean style of shepherding that I dealt with last time. So we would ask, what is one of the chief characteristics of Eastern Mediterranean style sheep herding, such as has been practiced since the beginning in North Africa, in the Middle East, and all the way to the Indian subcontinent. If you guessed the absence of dogs, you would be spot on. I well remember my first time in Israel. I went with a group of pastors <clears throat> uh, with a tour company, um, and uh, they, they took us to Israel. We were in the company of a number of archaeologists um, and, um, and, and, uh, and scientists, uh, you know, anthropologists, archaeologists, uh, one guy spoke, one guy named Jackie spoke eight, spoke eight languages, um, has a doctorate in comparative religions. And um, so they took us all over and, and we, we got a, a, just a really good uh, exposure to archaeological digs and, and uh, what was really going on as opposed to what people thought was going on. One of the archaeologists was a an intelligence officer in the Israeli Defense Forces as a reserve, as a reservist. And I remember our small group being driven to the Judean wilderness, uh, where we encountered, not, not only did we have the opportunity to see a full-flown uh, Israeli uh, mechanized uh, tank practices where they were shooting 55-gallon drums, <clears throat> and they were doing it very near the Jordan River, they wanted the Jordanians to see how effective they were in their tank exercises. And wow, was that impressive. But we also saw a young Arab shepherd who tended to his flock, just as shepherds in that region have done for thousands of years. And it was wonderful to see it. Um, that young fellow, probably 12, 13 years of age, he led his flock of several hundred sheep. He led his flock by speaking to them. The flock followed him because they had learned as lambs from the examples shown them by the older sheep in the flock to trust the shepherd's leadership and oversight. So the young ones learn from the older ones. Uh, our job is to follow the shepherd and, and go where he wants us to go and do what he wants us to do. That young shepherd kept watch over them to guard against predators, not so many these days as back in the day. Remember, David uh, had to protect his flocks from lions and from bears. There are no longer lions and bears uh, in that part of the world, though there were. The young uh, shepherd also performed his, his responsibilities of scouting the terrain in search of good pasture for grazing, which is really a challenge in the Judean wilderness. And, and he certainly knew where the water was to satisfy their thirst. This, um, this young fellow, I noticed and was pointed out to me, I didn't notice it was pointed out to me, that he also had a few goats that he tended along with his flock of sheep. But the goats, uh, it was observed, were a bit troublesome. Goats, you see, have to be driven rather than being led as a shepherd leads a flock. And here, as I look back on that many years later, it causes me to think upon the problem that many congregations have in our day, that there are so many goats mixed with the sheep that the pastor, frequently without realizing what he's doing, adapting <clears throat> um, without giving a great deal of conscious thought to what he has to do to hold attention, what he has to do to lead, what he has to do to get done what he wants to get done, 
Uh, and the problem with the congregations of our day is that there are so many goats mixed with the sheep that the pastor is actually functioning more as a goat herd than as a shepherd, especially if the pastor does not cultivate a cautious eye to discern the righteous from the wicked. Think about that, beloved. It is appropriate to discern the righteous from the wicked. I mean, not with 100% certainty, obviously. Sometimes, of course, people indignantly claim that it is, it's just unthinkable for a shepherd to attempt to distinguish between sheep and goats. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. I, 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 I grow so weary of that mis <laughs> so frequently misused uh, portion of the Bible. <clears throat> Um, and they'll say those that are that are that are more accomplished than others will say. After all, what about the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew chapter thirteen, verses twenty-four through thirty-two? Uh, obviously, the the parable of the wheat and the tares uh, shows that we should not try to discern. Um, let me caution you against allowing Augustine's misapplication of that parable. Because what most believers do nowadays when they say, oh, we mustn't judge, we mustn't judge wheat versus tares, wheat versus tares, that is a misapplication of the parable that was foisted upon Christendom by Augustine back in the day. And he used it to justify his, his tolerance of the flood of unconverted people into what has come to be known since then as the Church of Rome. <clears throat> so don't let his misapplication of that, of that parable throw you off. And I say this because the Savior clearly taught in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So we would ask, should caution be exercised? Well, of course, caution should be exercised. But if you don't think a, a, a pastor uh, should have should try to cultivate some measure of discerning uh, skill in discerning between between the righteous and the wicked, uh, how in the word are we to know who to baptize? Do you just take a person's word for it that he's a believer? Uh, the Bible speaks against that, the principle of two or three witnesses. Uh, is a young woman supposed to just marry a guy because he claims to be a Christian? Um, uh, is she left uh, without any possible hope of, of discerning with some level of certainty whether or not the man who proposes marriage to her is genuinely uh, a believer in Jesus Christ? Uh, and so we, yeah, we, we are given, we are given um, uh, instruction and direction and, and pastors uh, need to cultivate a level of discernment so that they will know or have uh, some level of confidence that the people they're dealing with are part of the flock or um, a herd of goats. Now, I mentioned last time that Mr. Spurgeon, the 19th century London Baptist pastor, led a congregation of more than 5,000, and he did so with one secretary and one part-time associate pastor. That was the paid staff at Metropolitan Tabernacle. Oh, by the way, Mr. Spurgeon, for most of that time, drew no salary. Not that pastors shouldn't be supported. First Corinthians chapter 9 shows that. But Mr. Spurgeon had such an income from uh, his, re his printed sermons that people wanted to buy for a penny and read that uh, he, was never, he was never in need of support from his uh, pastoral ministry. So how, how did Spurgeon manage to, to uh, provide pastoral leadership for 5,000 people, uh, considering that he, he, he corresponded with 200 people a week? 
considering that uh, they didn't have all the technological advantages of that day uh, that we do now, considering that he was, he was a man who was in chronically poor health. So how did he manage all of that uh, pastoral responsibilities? Well, keep in mind how different his ministry was and how different his congregation was from congregations today and most ministries today, Mr. Spurgeon's ministry was a profoundly spiritual ministry with leadership of a congregation of mostly converted members. That's very different from nowadays. Many pastoral ministries are not very spiritual and the congregations that they lead are not mostly converted members who were eager to serve God on their own initiative. Spurgeon had, had 5,000 people attending, uh, and, and a huge number of them, they really wanted to serve God. They really wanted to get after it, and uh, Mr. Spurgeon just provided direction and encouragement for them, but all of the blood, sweat, and tears, and all of the, of the planning, and, and the and the preparation, um, they provided the elbow grease to do the ministry. And so he did not, Mr. Spurgeon did not need a, a pack of young associates to coax and corral members into performing these various ministry tasks. These people were motivated by their love of the truth and the prompting of the Spirit of God and needing pastoral guidance and instruction and and encouragement and direction, um, and it didn't require um, a large staff in order for him to do that. Wow, we should take note of that in our day. Mr. Spurgeon was an actual shepherd of the Eastern Mediterranean style, where he led them, and he didn't use a pack of dogs to yip and nip at the, con at the flock. And his, his congregation was an actual flock of spiritual sheep. And they followed his leadership because he brought them to Christ as a shepherd does at lambing time. If you know anything about sheep, <clears throat> and I don't know much about sheep, but I do know a little bit. I know that sheep are so thoroughly domesticated that there is an extraordinarily high fatality rate at lambing time when ewes are delivering their young lambs if the shepherds are not on hand to pull those lambs. Um, and that's kind of pastoral ministry. Uh, pastors have the great privilege of introducing someone to the Savior, not as a go-between, not as a mediator, but as someone who has the privilege and the opportunity of introducing the sinner to the Savior, because there's, there's no mediator between men and God but, but Christ. He's the only mediator. But pastors function in somewhat of a lambing capacity, and, and Mr. Spurgeon did that. He was always, he was always there. Um, he was involved in, in uh, bringing bringing these people to Christ, and after that he fed them, and after he fed them, he, he, um, he listened to their testimonies carefully. Uh, he guided them um, through the process, um, bringing them in front of his entire congregation so that the congregation could hear uh, their conversion testimonies, and then, and then authorizing their baptism. And once they were baptized and became members of, of, of that church, uh, then Mr. Spurgeon exercised his, his under-shepherd responsibilities of protecting them. And I remind you again of something that I mentioned last week. The, the pattern that is so clear in Mr. Spurgeon's ministry, not just from the sermons that he preached, but his, um, um, his book on pastoral theology, um, his autobiography, uh, the articles that were written about him. We know a great deal about his, uh, we know a great deal about his ministerial practice. 
and and we understand that his ministerial practice uh he 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 followed a pattern that was was not unique uh his pattern of ministry was 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 not unusual here in new england um in the colonies before our nation's founding when back in the days of of you know uh cotton mather and jonathan edwards and other new england uh, divines there were a number of boston area congregations that averaged more than a thousand people every sunday morning in attendance and frequently those congregations function very well thank you with the pastor being aided by a single paid staff member uh you say well how do you do that well you have a, you have congregations of of converted people you have deacons that deek um and and you have interested church members who want to lend a hand who want to participate who want to be of help, who want to visit, who want to minister, who want to serve. Um, and uh, we don't have much of that anymore because we don't have very many congregations anymore that are primarily congregations of sheep. Rather, they're so frequently herds of goats. Um, and therefore, pastors uh, somewhat inadvertently, somewhat unconsciously, find themselves becoming far too pragmatic in doing what seems to work. And when they do what seems to work, they avoid getting at the root cause. Why is it that I must resort to these means to provide leadership to this group of people? Why is it that they are not responding to my shepherding? And it may be the reason they're not responding to your shepherding, sir, there's nothing wrong with your shepherding. There's something wrong with their sheeping. They're not sheep. So maybe just one aspect of your shepherding would be paying attention to whether or not those who are in the auditorium are really sheep. Well, those who come into membership via believer baptism are really believers. Those who are accepted from other congregations of like faith and practice are genuinely born again. Uh, we had uh, something on the order of two years ago, uh, had someone um, come to our church and, uh, and was just, just well, well thought of in a very, very prominent uh, East Coast Baptist congregation. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely absolutely can convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that that person was as that that person is as far as i know uh as lost as a goose why because the the pastor um did not carefully consider a conversion testimony um and um did not subject it to some real spiritual scrutiny so uh, I'm of the opinion that the Eastern Mediterranean style of leadership uh, works well when it is worked. Uh, it works well uh, when those you are attempting to lead are sheep and not goats. Um, and what happens when you find yourself with a group of goats, you find yourself resorting to a Western Mediterranean style of, of shepherding. Uh, using the modern day version of sheepdogs, or you resort to the to the Gentile approach, which is lording it over a congregation using uh, the, the worldly type of, of leadership. I, just let me wrap up this way. I, I'm convinced that God raises up pastors from time to time who are so gifted that they are quite capable of leading large flocks and doing so without compromising their leadership style, doing so without resorting to worldly philosophies, doing so without the necessity of misusing large staffs, uh, doing so without resorting to manipulative marketing techniques 
and all of that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, I call several such pastors that I know presently, I, I call them friends. Uh, <clears throat> they, they have significant ministries and impact, and, and they have a, a very spare staff. Why? Because they're leading uh, flocks of sheep. Because over the course of the decades of their ministries, um, they have been very careful to uh, make sure that the baptism they practice is believer baptism. Um, and, and those that are received into their membership are scrutinized carefully. That said, uh, though there are some pastors who are so equipped to pastor and preside over large congregations, throughout most of Christian history, congregations that are led by spiritual leaders who employed Eastern style, Eastern Mediterranean style of shepherding, such as is found in the word of God, such as was employed by the Savior, such was, as was employed by the apostles of Jesus Christ, most, most congregations throughout Christian his history have not been huge congregations. Um, <clears throat> and the reason they haven't been huge is because the, the, the leaders that God has provided those congregations uh, were equipped to deal with the congregation of that size. Um, such a scriptural approach to ministry, which is to say the Eastern Mediterranean style, for want of uh, a, a better, more descriptive phrase, you could call it biblical, uh, because it is biblical. Uh, such a scriptural approach to ministry is no counterpart to the Gentile pattern of exercising lordship over others, that the Savior so strongly disapproved of, uh, the Lord favored servant leaders and not bosses whose subordinates fear the threat of his scowl and disapproval and whose church members are led to believe that spiritual conduct is conduct that pleases the pastor rather than conduct that pleases the Savior. Neither does such an approach to ministry resemble, except superficially, the Western Mediterranean style of shepherding that relies so strongly on sheepdogs, with shepherds having little to do um, with the sheep of the flock week in and week out. These pastors almost never have intimate connection with a significant number of their members. I, I know pastors who lead in this fashion who have, who have baptized thousands of people Without a, without a single conversation taking place between pastor and baptismal candidate to evaluate the candidate's fitness for believer baptism. These guys baptize thousands of people without ever one time having a conversation with any of them. The type of shepherding found in New Testament congregations is supposed to resemble Eastern Mediterranean style shepherding with a comfortable intimacy being the relationship that exists between the shepherd, the under shepherd and the individual sheep. Well, I see that I'm out of time. Um, I will wrap this up next week by spending the entire session with two illustrations. Uh, one illustration will be Mr. Spurgeon's approach to ministry and, and another one is a modern day Southern California 21st century approach that illustrates the wrong way to do it. And so until then, uh, Lord bless you. Good night. And let's wrap this up with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Please bless us. Give us wisdom. Help us to do things in such a way that you are pleased and the Savior is exalted, and we will for that thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.